Cryptids are really interesting and really terrifying, but we all already know that. There's so many cryptid iceberg videos on YouTube and Windigoon's doing like a series of like a million videos on it. So I wanted to make a video on some lesser known cryptids that are gonna actually still be interesting and might even be ones that you might not have heard of yet. Without further ado, go follow my Instagram where I post pretty regularly. Go join my Discord where we can hang out and talk. And yeah, let's just get straight into this. And we're gonna start with Champ. Champ Champy or the Lake Champlain monster is the name given to a reputed lake monster living in Lake Champlain. The lake is a natural freshwater lake in North America and partially situated across the US-Canada border in the Canadian province of Quebec, and is across the Vermont-New York border. While there is no scientific evidence for this cryptid's existence, there have been over 300 reported sightings, which is crazy. The legend of the monster is considered a draw for tourism in the Burlington, Vermont, and Plattsburgh, New York areas. Like the Loch Ness Monster, most regard Champ as a legend. Others have speculated that it is possible such a creature does live deep in the lake and is possibly a relative of the plesiosaur, which is like an extinct group of aquatic reptiles, which is a dinosaur if you couldn't tell by the name. <laughs> lake Champlain is a 125 mile or 200 kilometer long body of fresh water that is shared by New York and Vermont and just a few miles into Quebec, Canada. The Champ legend has been a revenue generating attraction. Like for example, the village of Port Henry, New York has erected a giant model of Champ and holds Champ Day on the first Saturday of every August. As the mascot of Vermont's lone minor league baseball affiliate, the Vermont Lake Monsters, Champ became more prominent after the team was renamed from the Vermont Expos to the Lake Monsters. Champ has been the primary attraction of the New York Penn League affiliate since their inception too, which is crazy. Also, here's a pretty interesting fun fact. The scientific name Champ something American Sus has been proposed, which is awesome. American Sus? So in 1977, amateur photographer Sandra Mancy released a photograph that appeared to show a plesiosaur-like body and neck sticking out of the lake. Mancy later showed the photo, which is similar to the famous surgeon's photo of the Loch Ness Monster, to Joseph W. Zarensky. The entire bay of the lake where the photograph reportedly was taken is no deeper than 14 feet. According to Joe Nickel, there are few explanations for how a giant creature could swim, let alone hide in such shallow water. Furthermore, it has been suggested that the object in the photograph could possibly be a rising tree trunk or log. Rotting trees often gather gas in the process of decay and sometimes rise to the water's surface at a considerable speed. And so that picture I was just talking about is pretty much like the picture of Champ everybody knows. And it does look a lot like the Loch Ness Monster picture. Now, like I said, over the years, there have been over 300 reported sightings of Champ. The original story is related to like ancient legends of giant snakes, actually. So French cartographer Samuel de Champlain, the founder of Quebec and the lake's namesake, is often claimed to be the first European to sight a Champ in 1609. The earliest source for this claim is a summer 1970 issue of the magazine Vermont Life. The magazine quoted Champlain as having documented documented a 20 foot or 6 meter serpent thick as a barrel and a head like a horse. There's no actual evidence that he ever said this exactly, but he did document a large fish. In one of his like diaries, he wrote about like these like huge, huge fish that he saw, and that is confirmed. An 1819 report in the Plattsburgh Republican entitled Cape and Serpent on Lake Champlain reports a Captain Crumb sighting an enormous serpentine monster. Crumb estimates the monster to have been about 187 feet long and approximately 200 yards away from him. Despite the great distance, he claimed to have witnessed it being followed by two large sturgeon and a billfish, and was able to see that it had three teeth and eyes the color of peeled onions. He also described the monster as having a belt of red around its neck and a white star on its forehead. In 1883, Sheriff Nathan Mooney claimed that he saw a water serpent about 20 rods, which is the equivalent of about 110 yards, from where he was on the shore. He claimed that it was so close that he could see white round spots inside its mouth, and the creature appeared to be 25 to 30 feet in length. Mooney's sighting led to many more alleged eyewitnesses coming forward with their own accounts of Champ. Now, Champ reportedly can be seen in a video taken by fisherman Dick Affelter and his stepson Pete Baudet in the year of 2005. Close examination of the images may be interpreted either as a head and a neck of a plesiosaur-like animal, and, either an, and even an open mouth in one frame and a closed mouth in another, or as a fish or an eel. Although two retired FBI forensic image analysts who reviewed the tape said it appears authentic and unmanipulated, one of them added that, quote, there's no place in there that I can actually see an animal or any other object on the surface. One piece of evidence, though not a sighting per se, is the recording of echolocation from within the lake by the Fauna Communications Research Institute in 2003, working as part of a Discovery Channel program. The group has concluded that the sounds they recorded are similar to that of a beluga whale or perhaps an orca, but not of an known animal, and no dolphin or whale species has been previously known to live in the lake. Next up, we have the cactus cat. 
The cactus cat is a mythical creature and fearsome critter that has been reported in the American Southwest. It's described as a bobcat-like animal with thorn-like fur, sharp bones protruding from its front legs, and a branched tail. The cactus cat has been sighted in the southwestern desert in states like California, Nevada, and New Mexico, with a few sightings in Colorado as well. Cowboys and pioneers of the 19th century made up tales about strange beasts coming out at night, slashing open cacti, exposing the sap. On later nights, the creature was said to drink this juice. This caused the cats to enter an intoxicated state, stumbling around and rarely attacking travelers. Attacks by these strange varmint, though considered rare, did happen from time to time, with, with many frontiersmen waking up to find welts in their body from the cat's barbed tail. Despite these attacks, the cactus cat was not considered an aggressive creature, except towards cacti. The creature was known to have a unique and haunting wail that could be heard at night through the darkened desert, along with the dry sound of its bones rubbing together. In the book Fearsome Creatures from 2015, the cactus cat is the relative and the descendant of the wampus cat and the ball-tailed cat. The cat is remade to be the same but bigger and with a ball at the end of the tail that has spikes on it and on the cactus cat's tongue. The cactus cat is also no longer extinct in the book like with the roperite. The cactus cat does not like humans stealing cactus sap to be made as a syrup alternate and he kills those who did. The story of the cactus cat is probably fueled by numerous cases of misidentification, most likely being a bobcat, a mountain lion, or a porcupine. The cat's wail may have been also that of like a Puma, it's also said that likely the affable cactus cat was never believed to exist, and like most fearsome critters, was a product of a few bored woodsmen on a warm desert night, which is interesting to think about. You know, people out in the woods, out on the desert, telling stories and stuff, and then it kind of caught on. That's what makes cryptid so interesting to me, like the book behind it. Suchinoko. The Suchinoko, meaning dirt child or child of hammer, is a snake-like cryptid from the mountainous regions of western Japan. These creatures are commonly reported as slithering deep within the watery cave of Shikoku and Honshu. Signs that Suchinoko might be in your area include hearing a mouse-like squeak coming from a river, or in some cases, a seemingly human voice mimicking your conversation from the depths of a dank cave. They're reported to be between 30 and 80 centimeters long, so pretty short. That's about between a foot and like three feet, about. The name Suchinoko is used in western Japan, however, it is also known as Baki Hebi in northeastern Japan. It has a total of 50 plus names though all over Japan, but Suchinoko is just like boxing. Although there are some differences throughout the various sightings, the Suchinoko is widely regarded to look like a very wide, common snake with a central girth wider than its head and tail. Large, plate-like scales run down its body. It reportedly has fangs and venom similar to common snakes. Some accounts also describe the Suchinoko as being able to jump up to a meter in distance, followed immediately by a second jump while still in the air. So these things can like double jump, bruh. It is also reported to sometimes swallow its tail and roll like a wheel, similar to the hoop snake. According to legend, some Suchinoko are able to speak and are notorious liars. They are also said to have a taste for alcohol. The Suchinoko is also referenced in the Kojiki, which is the oldest book about the history of Japan. The Suchinoko is a popular and well-known cryptid in Japan, with many residents believing in its existence or claiming to have seen it. On May 3rd, an annual Suchinoko festival is held in Higashi Shirakawa in Gifu Prefecture, where the roots of the legend can be traced. At this festival, participants go Suchinoko hunting with a 1.2 million yen award for anyone who can find one. Now this is about $11,000 in US money. That's a lot. The government of Yoshi Okayama once offered a 20 million yen or $200,000 award for the successful capture of a Suchinoko. In June 1994, a man named Kazuaki Noda and his wife reported having come across a huge snake with a thick body like a beer bottle and a head described being that like a tortoise. On May 8th, 2000, a farmer named Suji Tanaka reported having come across two metallic colored snakes with tails like rats. In the same year in June, a woman named Utsoko Arima reported a Suchinoko swimming along a river. She describes her experience as follows. I was surprised. I just pointed at it and said, who are you? Who are you? It didn't answer me, but it just stared. It had a round face and didn't take its eyes off. I can still see the eyes now. They were big and round and it looked like they were floating on the water. I've lived over 80 years, but I've never seen anything like that in my life. Now, one notable case involves a farmer allegedly spotting the Suchinoko while cutting grass. He described it as having a face similar to that of a Doraemon, which is a popular Japanese cartoon character. He reported to have injured it with his weed whacker before the creature made its escape. A few years later, an old woman discovered its dead body laying it by the side of a stream and buried it, not realizing how important it was. When word eventually got out, the local government sent out a team to dig it up and sent it to the local university for examination. The professor who examined the creature said it may be a Suchinoko, but scientifically speaking, 
thinking it was a kind of snake. Many other bodies and like shedded skins have come forward, but these are mostly thought to be from known species of snakes. The sudden rise of sightings were caused by Suchinoko Boom, which was caused by some books published on searching for this peculiar creature. The most famous is Runaway Suchinoko, which is a book about the author of it and his team and the sightings and incidents that he investigated about the Suchinoko. Because of this, old people started to talk about the snake, and then even if someone saw Suchinoko, it was a taboo to say you did because people believed that you would be cursed if you ever saw one. Most Suchinoko sightings are thought to be misidentified known species of snakes. It's also possible that sightings could be of snakes that have recently been fed, giving them like a bulging middle. They could also be misidentified sightings of blue tongue skinks, which are kept as pets by some Japanese people. These are like really, really cute little lizards. Um, editor put a picture on screen. These things are so cute. Blue tongue skinks. I'm like, so it's possible that these lizards may have escaped their homes and were spotted by other people. But it's also possible the Suchinoko could be a new species of snake altogether. However, the blue tongue skink must have However, the blue tongue skink misidentification theory can't explain most of the sightings until they became public and like common in the pet trade. And they were first brought to Japan in 1970, but they were still very rare back then. And misidentifications of snakes can't explain the body shape of credible photos of the Sushinoko. Next up, we have a Billy Ape. Okay, I'm seeing the picture right now, and oh my god, bro, these things, these things look awesome, bro. So Billy Apes or Bondo Mystery Apes are giant primates that appear to live in remote East Africa, where much evidence points to their existence in photos, footprints, and ground nests. They may be a hybrid between a gorilla and a chimpanzee or a new species altogether. Billy apes have a very flat face, a wide muzzle, and their brow ridge runs straight across and overhang. They seem to turn gray very early in life, but instead of turning gray black like a gorilla, they just turn gray all over. They have brow ridges running straight across and overhanging, uniform gray fur independently of age and sex, which suggests that graying takes place early in life, opposed to all known gorilla species where only male gray as they age, and the graying is restricted only to their backs. Billy ape skulls have the prominent brow ridge and may have a sagittal crest similar to that of a robust great ape, but other morphological measurements are more like those of chimpanzees. However, chimpanzee skulls are 190 to 210 millimeters long, but four of five Billy ape skulls measured more than 220 milliliters, well beyond the end of the normal chimpanzee range. It should be made clear that only one of the many skulls found at Billy had a sagittal crest, so it cannot yet be considered typical for the population of guys. The Billy ape has been reported to walk upright bipedally, which means like on two legs at times, with the looks of a giant chimpanzee. Later observations by Cleve Hicks, who is like uh, the leader of a project where they're like researching these guys, reveal that they are knuckle walkers like other chimpanzees that only occasionally walk bipedally. Their footprints, which range from 28 to 34 centimeters, are longer than the largest common chimp and gorilla footprints, which average 26 centimeters and 29 centimeters respectively. Hicks' team has, in a year and a half of study, found no footprints longer than 30 centimeters, and most have been smaller. Female billy apes, however, have genital swellings similar to other chimpanzees. In local parlance, the great apes of the billy forest fall into two distinct groups. There are the tree beaters, who disperse high into the trees to stay safe, who easily succumb to the poison arrows used by local hunters. Then there are the lion killers, who seldom climb trees, are bigger and darker, and who are unaffected by the poison arrows used by locals. In some ways, the apes behave more like gorillas than chimpanzees. For example, they build ground nests as gorillas do, using interwoven branches and saps bent down into a central bowl. However, they frequently nest in the trees as well. Often ground nests will be found underneath or in proximity to tree nests. Their diet is also decidedly chimpanzee-like, consisting mainly of fruits. Billy apes don't howl at the moon, instead they pant put in tree drum like other chimpanzees. Pretty crazy. Pretty cool. These guys are awesome. Behavior towards humans have baffled and intrigued scientists. There is little to no aggression, but no fear either. Gorilla males will always charge when they encounter a hunter, but there were no stories like that about the Billy Apes, according to Armin, who was another member of that Project Billy Ape I was talking about. Instead, they would come face to face with their human cousins, stare intently in like a half recognition, and then slide away quietly. Hicks' group later confirmed and somewhat expanded those observations, saying that when they encountered a large group of Billy apes in deep forests, far from the roads and villages, they not only approach the humans, but would actually surround them with intent curiosity. Hicks clarifies the issue as follows. The apes within 20 kilometers or so of the roads flee humans almost without exception. The adult males show the greatest fear, and then further from the roads, however, the chimpanzees become progressively, like, naive almost. Now, apparently these guys are not even, like, a new species. They're just, like, larger, calmer eastern chimps, according to one source, but there's not a lot of information on this, so I don't know 
know what to believe, but these guys are pretty awesome. Next up, we have Mongolian Death. The Mongolian Death Worm's native name, Algoi Korkoi, means intestine worm. Due to its red blood-like color and size, which is the size of intestine, it's been described by many to be from 2 to 7 feet long, have the ability to spit out a corrosive yellow saliva, and generate blasts of electricity. However, the latter power is thought of as being folkloric by the nomads of Gobi. Western culture has come to call this monster the Mongolian Death. Mongolian nomads believe the giant worm covers its prey with an acidic substance that turns everything a corroded yellow color. Legend says that as the creature begins to attack, it raises a half its body out of the sand and starts to inflate until it explodes, releasing the lethal poison all over the unfortunate victim. The poison is so venomous that the prey dies instantly. Livestock and humans are supposed to be its main prey. Because Mongolia has been under Soviet control until 1990, very little is known about the death worm in the West. In recent years, investigators have been able to look for evidence of this creature's existence. Ivan McCurl, one of the leading Loch Ness monster detectives, studied the region and interviewed many Mongolian people about the worm. Due to the sheer volume of sightings and strange deaths, he came to the conclusion that the death worm was more than just a legend. Nobody is entirely sure what the worm actually is. Experts are certain that it's not a real worm because the Gobi Desert is too hot an area for annelids like worms to survive. Some have suggested it might be a skink, but they have little legs and scaly skin, whereas witness accounts by the worm is limbless and a smooth body. Some have suggested it might be a skink, but they have little legs and scaly skin, whereas witnesses specify that the worm is limbless and smooth body. The most possible and probable explanation is that the death worm is a new species of like a worm lizard or a amphisbania, which is a group of burrowing reptiles. Although the native Mongolian people are convinced the death worm's nature, it will take years of research to satisfy the rest of the world's scientific community. People don't believe it. In 2005, an expedition from the Center for Vertian Zoology crossed a thousand miles of the Gobi on the track of the death worm. They concluded that it was probably a large, unknown type of worm lizard and that the powers attributed to it were apocryphal. This guy is scary, bro. I mean, look at these pictures, bro. Look at these pictures, man. These are scary, dog. All right, and with that, we actually finish layer one. So next, we're going to get into layer two, starting with the Wallatson Park Gnomes. Okay, this entry is pretty special to me um, because gnomes are like my favorite cryptid. I love Grickle. One of my first videos I ever posted on this channel was about Grickle and his like scariest thing in my opinion is like these like hidden people gnomes. And I low-key want to make a video about his stuff at some point because it's just so cool to me. But anyways, gnomes are just super creepy and interesting and mysterious and really cool to me. So I'm excited for this one. So yeah, let's talk about these Wallaton Park gnomes. In the late summer evening of September 23rd, 1979, Walton Park in Nottingham became the stage for an extraordinary and enigmatic event that has since captivated the imagination of researchers, podcasters, and just people who are interested in this stuff. A group of primary school children numbering between six and eight embarked on what was to be an adventurous foray into the realms of the unknown, resulting in what has come to be known as the Walton Gnomes Encounter. The adventure began pretty innocently enough, you know, with the children meeting around eight o'clock in the evening, setting out from their home and trespassing onto the grounds of a local school before venturing into the park. Walton Park, with its expansive green spaces and historical significance, was officially closed at the time, so that must have made it even more unnerving for the kids, you know? And at this point, the children seemed to have wandered across one of the lush fields in the parks, and they came to a bit of a fenced woodland. This area was known by local kids as the Swamps, and there was one local who actually remembered losing shoes there in his childhood. The park authorities allowed no one into this boggy area, hence the fence. But some of the children decided to go through a hole in the marshy woodland beyond. The evening was about to get even more interesting. And apparently four of the kids went in. And these were the older members of the group. It was Andrew, Patrick, Angela, and Rosie. Now, once this older group was in the swamps, the encounter began. First, the children saw movement in the treetops. And then gnome cars appeared and began to chase them. These were like little tiny cars that gnomes were driving. According to legend, I guess, the kids saw 30 small cars, each with a gnome driver and a gnome passenger. The two boys fell into a marsh, and in one account, the gnomes dropped on their backs, and in another, they drove them into the mud. The four, in any case, beat a swift. The four, in any case, just ran back into the field. And then we move into the next phase of the encounter. The four older kids are reunited with the younger kids. Two of the four, remember, are caked in mud. The older kids tell the younger children what they have seen, but the younger kids are having nothing. I mean, they don't believe it. However, at that point, the gnome cars emerge from out of the swamp and come after all the kids. The kids run for the exit and we're not sure which one though, and then the gnomes desist and don't ch 
chase them under the street. Now, the light is something that's really interesting here. Okay, I'm gonna read directly from this article of a guy who has like been on podcasts and researched it himself, okay? So here's what he says. I've struggled here to reconstruct the sequence of events, but the second issue to bear in mind is the quality of light that evening. When over the years I've imagined this encounter, I've thought of the children coming across the gnomes at twilight. I had probably picked up on some of the comments and the sources to the light and particularly to the street lights. I now realize that this is far more important than I had originally understood. Sunset on September 23rd was at 7.02 p.m. Dusk was at 7.36 and by 8 p.m. when the kids met, it was entirely dark. I take these times from Dan Green's essay in the book. And for context, this guy edited a book with original sources and 10 essays by various folklorists, fairyists, and forteans, whatever that's. And there's even the, like an interview transcript of the children recorded less than 48 hours after the sighting and two pictures drawn by the children, but we'll get into that later. Anyways, there was a weak crescent moon in the sky and it had been a rainy day. We can assume, I think, that the sky was at least partly overcast. When the kids came into the park, it was already full night. As they went across the field, it was black. There was some light from the nearby houses and from the distant streetlights. Then they arrived at the fence of the swamps. There must have been some secondary light there for them to find their way through the fence into the swamps. Chris Woodyard joked on the podcast that kids had double dared themselves to go into the swamps. At 8, 9, or 10, I'm not sure I would have had the courage. It must have been a good deal breaker within the swamps and in the field. There were trees and there was an overgrowth. This was a wild, unmanaged bit of the wood. Three of the children were interviewed about what they saw in the swamps. The descriptions were remarkably detailed. They talked of the color of the beards and clothes, trousers with patches. They talked of the hats of the gnomes and also of the color of their cars. They stated confidently that there were 30 cars with 60 gnomes and then each of the three kids repeated these exact same numbers. It would have been absolutely impossible to see these things under normal nighttime conditions though. Both the headmaster who asked the questions in the transcript, Robin Aldridge, and Majorie Johnson in her report recognized that the lack of light was a real problem. The headmaster asked the children individually how they had seen things given the lack of light. Patrick talked to the gnomes glowing in the dark, quote, they showed up. Andrew claimed there was a light in the trees, quote, we've seen a light in the trees hanging. Marjorie Johnson, who believed the account, insisted that fairies have their own light and can be seen in the dark. But then almost all derivative accounts, including contemporary newspapers, just skimmed over these awkward details. The writer of the book, Frank Ear, gives some reasons for thinking that the episode may have been invented. I'm going to keep an open mind on that, at least for now, but I do think of the encounter in a different way from when I started putting the book and podcast together. This, for what it's worth, is my reconstruction. Here were half a dozen kids having fun in the dark. They passed into the park brimming with a spear of adventure, and four of them, the older and braver, decided to penetrate the swamps. There, something happened, and the children had their encounter. Certainly, two of them got in an almighty and muddy mess. I don't know what took place in the swamps. This is the real mystery. The older and younger children then met up again outside the swamps and ran for the exit, the whole group infected by the exhilaration of the older kids. I'm less impressed by claims the children saw gnomes in the second phase of the encounter. My impression is that this really could have been group hysteria, for lack of a better word. Younger children caught between enjoyment and fear of their nighttime walk, glimpsing things in the bushes as they ran for the street. What happened in the swamps, though? There are, to my mind, three possibilities that I throw out to be taken up or rejected according to the reader's instincts. Or I guess, in this case, of me reading this, viewer's instincts. First, the four children went into the swamp and two of them got dirty. The gnomes became an excuse to explain what happened, an excuse that was just created on the fly and then elaborated on as they chased with the younger kids for the exits. Perhaps playing the younger kids, one of whom was crying, was part of the fun. Second, the four were spooked by some stimulus and in the dark and after being muddied, the stimulus, like maybe a startled animal or something, inspired the sense of an encounter. I can imagine, say, an escaping fox being understood to be a little man in a car, like nighttime visions are just full of inconceivable misunderstandings, you know? The children filled the gaps talking to each other and then came up with the 30 gnomes in the car. Witness accounts can initially spiral up before being nailed down in repeated tellings. And then thirdly, the four met little people driving in cars. Little people in their vehicles glowed in the dark and chased the children. What is the correct answer? I don't know. However, there is another discovery that I made while preparing the book that seems important to me. It is clear that Walton Park was a place with a reputation for fairy encounters. Several are associated with the grounds. About 10 relevant encounters are included in the book. It also emerges that the children had claimed to see, again in the dark, gnomes in the park in the summer holidays two or three months before. Finally, one of the children's older siblings saw more gnomes in cars the day after their sighting. Reading between the lines, it appears that the half dozen Walton kids, and perhaps local kids just in general, had a private folklore about the park and some mysterious being
beings that live there. That this could be taken as useful proof that the Walton kids really did see gnomes on that Sunday night in 1979. Or alternatively, this could be the context that we need to explain how a dunking in the mud in the dark, perhaps associated with some minor stimulus, became an encounter with a bunch of gnome cars. The mystery remains, and the conversation will continue. This stuff is so creepy. I love this stuff. Here are the pictures I was talking about that the kids drew on screen right here. Look at them. These are the kids' drawings. And then here is a picture of what Walton Park actually looks like. This stuff's really cool. I spent so long on this one, guys. I apologize. This is just so interesting to me. Next up, we have monopods. Monopods are mythological human creatures with a single large foot extending from a leg centered in the middle of the body. They were described by Pliny the Elder in Naturalis Historia. Pliny describes how travelers have reported their encounters or sites of monopods in India, and he records their stories. Pliny remarks how they are first mentioned by Theseus in his book, Indica, or India, a record of the view of Persians in India, which only remains in fragments. Pliny describes monopods as thus. He, Theseus, speaks also of another race of men who are known as monocoli, who only have one leg, but are able to leap with surprising agility. The same people are also called Sciapidae, because they are in the habit of lying on their backs during the time of the extreme heat, and protects themselves from the sun by the shade of their feet, or I guess by their foot it would be. Philostratus mentions these monopods in his life of Apollo Aeneas of Tyana, and Saint Augustine mentions these monopods in The City of God, Book 16, in the 8th chapter, entitled Whether Certain Monstrous Races of Men Are Derived From the Stock of Adam or Noah's Sons. Now, it's possible that the myth derived from a misinterpretation of the practice of Indian yogis, or sadhu, who sometimes meditate on one foot. John of Marignoli provides an explanation of the creature. Quote from his travels, India is as follows. The truth is that no such people do exist as nations, though there may be an individual monster here and there. Nor is there any people at all such as has been invented, who have but one foot, which they use to shade themselves withal. But as all the Indians commonly go naked, they are in the habit of carrying a thing like a little tent roof on a cane handle, which they open out at will as protection against sun or rain. This sounds racist, I'm gonna be real guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> Norris explorer Thorvald Eriksson, brother of Leif Eriksson, was part of an expedition for the exploration of Vinland and became the first European to die in North America. America. As he was unloading his longboat for no apparent reason, a uniped, as the saga calls it, ran up to Thorvald and shot him in the belly with a bow and arrow, a wound which led to his death. Kind of crazy. These guys were also in Narnia. Um, I'm a Narnia fan. They were also in Narnia. <laughs> Monopods are kind of weird, bro. Imagine only have one foot, dude. You met, dude, that'd be kind of weird. Hopping everywhere. I couldn't do it, I don't think, guys. I'm be real. Right Next up, we have Encantado. Encantado are water cryptids that live in the Amazon, the longest river in South America. Encantado are basically dolphin men or wear dolphins, usually living as a Boto Corda Rosa. They are considered friends of fishermen in the Amazonian region and help fishing and safely conducting canoes during storms. Some say they have power over storms. Some are also said to help those who are drowning, removing them from the river. According to local folklore, every year at Fiesta Junina, a Brazilian celebration in June, this cryptid shape shifts from a pink river dolphin into a young man in white garments, but they have to wear a hat of some kind to conceal their unchanged blowhole. <laughs> These festive nights are the most dangerous time to see or be near in Cantado, as they attend parties and balls where they seduce, kidnap, and impregnate young women. Although they probably don't have magic powers, it is possible they are a new species of dolphins that people have just seen. The Encantado are notorious for their shape-shifting ability. They say that if you meet a handsome stranger at a festival, that it is more and likely an Encantado. They are not only found in the Brazilian carnival, they can also be found in Rio de Janeiro, Salvador, and in the Amazonias. Encantado means enchanted one. Not only are they cryptids, but they are are mythical creatures too, and Cantados may be a series of a hybrid dolphin. Although human and dolphin reproduction is not possible, they also are seen in the Philippines, in case you didn't know. Yeah, so Encantado is just like like mermaids, I guess, but like the men version, you know? Pretty cool though, it's like there's its own little interesting version of it, I like it. And also Spanish culture is so cool, Hispanic culture, Latin culture, I don't know what to call it, I'm gonna be real, I don't know what to call it, but you know what I mean, you know what I mean. Brazilian culture, South American culture. Next up we have Gnome in Argentina, which is actually a YouTube video that I will play on screen right now while I'm talking about it. I'll just put it over with no audio. The Argentina gnome was an entity allegedly caught on film in a small town in Argentina in 2008. The entity seen in the video appears to be a small humanoid creature approximately two feet in height. It possesses a long pointy hat, broad shoulders, and very short legs. When moving through the tall grass, it appears to have a waddling gait, but when it crosses the road later on, it walks sideways. It could be real, it could be an extraterrestrial. Um, it's actually, it's fake. It's actually totally fake. Um, sorry to get you guys. Sorry to prank you, prank you. You just got got.
not, bro. Got God. Um, but yeah, this is fake. <laughs> it's so cool that this video is well made. I like it. All right, and with that, we finish layer two. Let's get straight into layer three, starting with Snallygaster. Or is it Snallygaster? Snallygaster? I don't know. I'm not sure, guys. The Snallygaster is a mythical dragon-like beast said to inhabit the hills surrounding Washington and Frederick counties, Maryland. The area was settled by German immigrants beginning in the 1730s. Early accounts describe the community being terrorized by a monster called a Schnellergeist, meaning quick spirit in German. The earliest incarnations mix the half-bird features of a siren with the nightmarish features of demons and ghouls. The Snellygaster was described as half reptile, half bird, with a metallic beak lined with razor-sharp teeth, occasionally described with octopus-like tentacles. It swoops silently from the sky to pick up and carry off its victims. The earliest stories claim that the monster sucked the blood of his victims. Seven pointed stars, which reputedly kept the Snellygaster at bay, can still be seen painted on local barns, which is really interesting and creepy. It has been suggested that the legend was resurrected in the 19th century to frighten freed slaves. Newspaper accounts throughout February and March 1909 describe encounters between local residents and a beast with quote, enormous wings, a long pointed bill, claws like steel hooks, and an eye in the center of his forehead. It was described as making screeches, quote, like a locomotive whistle. A great deal of publicity surrounded this string of appearances with the Smithsonian Institution offering a reward for the hide, like the hide of the beast. U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt reportedly considered postponing an African safari to personally hunt the beast. In 2008, author Patrick Boyton published a book about the history of the Snellygaster entitled Snellygaster, The Lost Legend of Frederick County. The Snellygaster has one widely known enemy called Deweyo. The Deweyo is reported to be a mammalian biped with features similar to a wolf, but the stance and stature of a man. The sightings of Deweyo are primarily reported in West Middletown, Maryland, but sightings have also been reported in the Wolfsville, Maryland region. The Deweyo and the Snellygaster have reportedly had vicious encounters dating back to early settlement of the Middletown Valley. Also in 2021, Sarah Cooper, a cryptozoologist in Maryland, opened the American Snellygaster Museum in Liberty Town, MD. Maryland is MD. <laughs> Next up we have the Crawfordsville Monster. The Crawfordsville Monster is an atmospheric beast that was sighted over Crawfordsville, Indiana in 1891. The cryptid, as told by witnesses, suggests an otherworldly creature. The citizens of Crawfordsville described a violently flapping quote, thing with a flaming red quote eye, 20 feet long and 8 feet wide. Descriptions of the creature vary, with some accounts suggesting that it had no head, with others describing it as having glowing red eyes and hot breath. Accounts generally agree, though, that it is a large, rectangular creature, possibly eel-like in appearance, with several undulating fins down the sides of its body. During a reported second appearance, witnesses described the creature as writhing and squirming, and producing a wheezing sound as if it were in pain. One of the strangest accounts was when a Methodist pastor named Reverend G.W. Switzer and his wife also saw the animal. The creature writhed as though in great pain, squirmed in agony, and sounded a wheezing, plaintive noise as it hovered at 300 feet. What is strange about the creature is that it has an eye in its mouth, three jaws, and appears to be a cyclops. It also seems to be eel-like in shape, with feathery protrusions coming out of its sides and back. Next up, we have Van Meter Visitor. 117 years ago, a strange creature was said to have paid a visit to the small town of Van Meter in Iowa. The strange events occurred in October of 1903. Several respected members of the community told of a mysterious winged creature that terrorized some of the town's residents during several nights in the course of the week. Descriptions of the beast suggested that it had large bat-like wings, left a terrible stench wherever it went, and even stranger, it fired beams of bright light from its forehead. This bizarre account recalls how several of the locals attempted to shoot the beast, but their gunfire didn't appear to have any effect. Fed up with the menace, a group of townsfolk banded together one evening and pursued the creature to an abandoned coal mine. There, they confronted not one but two of the beasts, which both turned and disappeared down into the gloom of the mine. The men opened fire on them, but they were never to be seen again. Next up, we have the Grunch Road Monster. The Grunch Road Monster is an alleged chupacabra sighting in New Orleans. The Grunch is described as being an elaborate cross between the canid and the reptilian chupacabra. New Orleans residents have named the creature the Grunch, but unlike its cousin sightings and tales, this one seems to go really far back in Louisiana's history. The Grunch story supposedly goes back to the Crescent City's early roots. New Orleans was founded on October 25th, 1718 by the French Mississippi Company, under the direction of Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne de Bienville. It was named for Philip 
Philippe II, Duke of Orleans, who was Regent of France at the time. His title came from the French city of Orleans. The French colony was ceded to the Spanish Empire in the Treaty of Paris and remained under Spanish control until 1805, when it reverted to French control. Many of the surviving architecture of the Vaucaire dates from this Spanish period. Now, as a principal port, New Orleans had the major role of any city during the antebellum era of the slave trade. Its port handled huge quantities of goods for export from the import of other countries to be traded up the Mississippi River. The river was filled with steamboats, flatboats, and sailing ships. At the same time, it had the most prosperous community of free persons of color in the South. Many old stories from people whose families were around at the time have been passed down to us in oral traditions concerning the Grunch. Legend has it that the Grunch dates back to the days of New Orleans' early settlement and that the name Grunch comes from the name of a road that was there. This southern cryptid has been called the Vampire of Farbo, Marangi, and the Bywater area, dating back to the early 1800s. The legend of Marie Laveau tells of how some people believe that this form of chupacabra came into existence. An old voodoo hoodoo story says that Marie Laveau castrated the devil baby when he was born to stop him producing from more of his kind. Yeah, all thanks for being there. The bloody testicles allegedly turned into a male and a female grunch upon falling to the floor, whereupon they attacked the great voodoo queen Marie Laveau. Oh my, can they stop shooting us? Can you guys hear that? There, there's somebody like shooting outside my window. I live in North Carolina. This is bad, bro. I mean, it makes sense. I live in North Carolina, so I'm not like surprised, but like, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Okay, they shut up, guys. Don't worry. The Grunch are said to have almost killed her with their fierce bites and punching. The terror the old voodoo queen felt must have been unbearable as she struggled under their great strength before she fainted. When she awoke, the Grunch and the devil baby were gone. Laveau was near death after this, and many have said that this is when Marie Laveau gave up her voodoo hoodoo ways and went back to being a good Catholic woman. New Orleans Grunches have many strange reported powers. The stories about them probably come from the fact that the New Orleans Chupacabra is more visible than in other areas and has adapted itself more to its surroundings. The most common description of the New Orleans Grunch, or El Chupacabra, is a goat-like being appearing to have leathery or scaly black gray skin and sharp spines with long horns or quills running down its back. This creature stands approximately three to four feet tall. They're also said to seem more intelligent and have human-like skills, like being able to open doors and use tools similar to how a monkey or a primate. It's said to howl like a wolf, scream like a banshee, or bellow and screech like an ape when alarmed, as well as leave a strong stench. Many reports note that the chupacabra's eyes glow in unusual red-orange or green. Some witnesses have reported seeing bat-like wings and a tail, or long fur and goat-like markings in gray on a silky black coat. Unlike conventional Louisiana swamp predators, this breed of chupacabra is said to drain all of the animal's blood, and sometimes organs, through a single hole. The legend of Grunch Road goes a little something like this. Some people claim it was in Clement, Louisiana, while others claim it was in Gentilly or Materi. But the real Grunch Road was located in a remote part of eastern New Orleans near the community of Littlewood. Most people only ever encountered Grunch Road by accident, a dead end of scant shells and sand sheltered by overgrown woods and great tall water oaks. It led into the ferny darkness off the major two-lane highway of Hain Boulevard, allegedly home to ghastly goat people and several ghosts of who only knows what. Although evidence for the Grunch Road being haunted by this beast is anecdotal, it is interesting to find an old tale that has its reflections in a more recent sighting. A Harvey, Louisiana lady said she saw one eating one of her neighbor's dogs. Also, sanitation workers tell of seeing them raid the garbage cans or chase the garbage trucks along New Orleans East Hain Boulevard and in the Grunch Road area. The Grunch slash El Chupacabra is said to haunt many areas in New Orleans and surrounding parishes. Lakeview, Materi, Clement, Harvey, Terrytown, Slittle, Covington, and Paradis. All these areas' residents have a Grunch story or two to tell. They are said to live in the darkest parts of New Orleans City Park's golf course and have been seen running in the tall grass and along the levees of Shelmet National Battlefield. In the Paradis, Luling, and Boo, Louisiana areas, many say late at night you can see them running across Highway 90 looking for something or someone to eat. Lakeview residents nowadays tell of how they no longer leave their pets in the yard since Hurricane Katrina, as so many grunches were displaced into the neighborhood. In my Harvey, Louisiana home, many people tell of seeing them knocking over trash cans and chasing cats to drink their blood. People at first thought they were rabid or mangy, hairless raccoons. And then I don't know if my editor already put the pictures on screen or not, but here are some pictures of the sightings. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, this one's pretty, pretty extensive and lengthy. There's like a lot of sightings. This one seems more believable, even though they're not really, any of them are believable. You know, 
now, you know. Next up, we have the Conakry Monster. The Conakry Monster was a carcass that was found on the shores of Guinea, Africa in May 2007. Its appearance is extremely memorable, to say the least. It had an armored back, a gaping mouth, fur, a long tail, and even four paws. This had the strangest appearance of any sea monster ever found. Its black back led people to believe that it may have been burned to death. The scientists who studied it had said they had never heard of anything like this creature, but they and some other people had some suggestions. They thought it could be a monster turtle, a monosaur, the rotting corpse of an undiscovered species of whale, or even the corpse of a woolly mammoth. Like many other cases of carcasses recorded, it mysteriously disappeared before more research could be done. Witnesses say that the quote charred skin is common amongst decomposing cetaceans, so the creature was simply that. But who can explain the paws, the armor, and the various other features that make this cryptid unique? The organism, however, is most likely just a very decomposed whale, is what most like scientists and like real people who know they're talking about think. And yeah, my editor should be putting a bunch of pictures on screen during all these. And they everybody say thank you to the editor down in the comments. Thank you, editor. And if you want to learn how to edit like my editor, he does have a little channel. Little channel put on the screen, dude. You can shout yourself out for a little second. He teaches how to edit. Go check him out. And that was layer three, guys. That means we're halfway through the iceberg. Let's go straight into layer four, starting with Michelin men. Michelin men or balloon men are a type of possibly extraterrestrial cryptid that has been reported on a rare number of occasions throughout the world. These entities were dubbed with these names due to their similarity in appearance to the popular Michelin man mascot. In May 1960, Antonio Ribera, a local teacher, was at a crossroads between Arco de la Frontera and El Bosque, both towns being in the providence of Cadiz, Spain. He was returning from a motorcycle trip when he discerned a strange human-like being about 150 meters or 500 feet away on a short, steep uphill incline of the highway that was ahead of him. He describes the being as follows. He was completely red from head to toe and suddenly appeared at the edge of the highway, rather tall, something like two meters or about six to seven feet or more. Having trouble walking and his walking was like a mechanical doll, that is to say like a robot with stiff arms. After stopping his motorcycle, he saw the humanoid was walking on the edge of the road and before going six steps, another individual of similar characteristics appeared and followed him. Like his predecessor, he appeared suddenly. The second humanoid was not so tall as he measured about one meter 20 centimeters or three foot 11 inches. And though he was also dressed in red, he had one difference with respect to his other. He had a black boot. Ribera could not remember if the boot was on the left foot or the right one, but he certifies that he saw it like that. The two humanoids then crossed the highway at an angle and Ribera saw the ringed outlines of the beings with a classic shape of the Michelin man. Ribera decided to get closer while he debated with himself over the danger entailed in this decision, so he again started up his vehicle. On reaching the curve in the highway to head toward the slope where the humanoids were, they had disappeared in the same mysterious manner that they had appeared. Another incident occurred on the island of Reunion in the Indian Ocean between Mara- I gotta, I gotta look up how to pronounce this stupid word. Oh, oh, y'all get mad when I mispronounce it. See, I never think about the pronunciation whenever I'm just like doing, like researching these videos and stuff, you know? Because I'm just like reading it. Like, I don't really think about how to pronounce it. And then I get to recording it and I'm like, I really don't feel like looking it up. So I don't look it up. And then y'all are like, oh, you pronounced this word wrong, actually. And I'm like, okay, dude, shut up. And I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna listen to you guys, okay? I'm gonna make you guys happy. Mauritius, okay? So I said Meridius, okay? Yeah. Mauritius, there we go. Another incident occurred on the island of Reunion in the Indian Ocean between Mauritius and Madagascar in an area known as the Plain de Cafres when a similar sighting was made on July 31st, 1968. Around 9 a.m., a local farmer named M. Luce Fontaine reported the following event. I was at the kilometer 21 mark in a small clearing in the middle of a forest of acacia trees that morning, and I was bending down and picking some grass for my rabbits when I suddenly saw a sort of oval-shaped cabin in the clearing. It was 25 meters from me and as though suspended at a height of 4 or 5 meters from the ground. The extremities of it were dark blue, the center part lighter, more transparent rather than like the windscreen of a Pirigo 404. Above and below it had what looked like two glass feet of shining metal. In the center of the cabin were two individuals with their backs toward me. The one on the left turned right round and so faced me. He was standing small about 90 centimeters in height, enveloped from head to feet in a sort of one piece overall, a bit like the suit worn by the Michelin man. The one on the right simply turned his head around towards me, but all the same I had time to catch a glimpse of his face which was partly masked by some kind of helmet. Then both turned their backs to me and there was a flash, as strong as the electric 
dark arc of a welding machine. Everything went white around me. A powerful heat was given off as it were a sort of blast of wind, and a few seconds later, there was nothing there anymore. Then I approached the spot over which the object had been. There were no marks. The object had a diameter of four or five meters and was about two and a half meters measured through from top to bottom. It was of a bluish color with white on the upper and lower parts. I told my wife all about it and the gender Marie and everyone at once believed me. A gender Marie is a military force with law enforcement duties among the civilian population. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not gonna re-record that. I really don't care. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I care about my videos, guys. I'm kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding, guys. I'll re-record it for you guys. Don't worry. Here, you know what? You want me to record it so bad? You want me to record it so bad? You want me to put some more effort in? A gender Marie is a military force with law enforcement duties among the civilian population. There we go. I read it right at that time. Okay, it's pronounced gendarmerie. Marie. Whatever. Whatever. You know what? I'm gonna try it harder for you guys. Okay, I'm gonna try even harder. I'm gonna get all the pronunciations right right now. Don't worry. Okay, guys, but don't get bored because we got more Michelin Man stuff, actually. We got more Michelin Man stuff. But if you are bored, you can look. You probably just like double tap the screen like maybe 10 times and you'll be past it, maybe. It's probably about like another, I don't know, minute and a half left of this. So just double tap like 10 times. Probably be on the next one. If you're getting bored, but you shouldn't be getting bored because my videos are awesome and amazing. All right, here we go. On March 14th, 1976, Vincente and Carmen Coral, a married couple, were driving along small roads of Spain's Castellan region. Around 10 p.m., the couple found themselves noticing strange phenomenon in the night skies and reported a white oval that floated to the left of their own car. Believing at first that it might be the headlights of a car on like a nearby hill, the corals only made it a few hundred feet before they believed they were driving into a quote, luminous tornado of sorts, as an object appeared to rise out of the ground. Bathing the object with his car's high beams, Mr. Coral was startled to see that it was a person. And then here's a quote from him. I suppose that it had two legs because they reminded me of a human profile. However, since they, the legs, were so close together, it looked more like a column than a human being. The thing was tall, good looking, and wore a close fitting one piece outfit. Now, the couple's initial fascination changed to fear as the lights on their car suddenly went out, leaving them in pitch blackness. The smell of burning wires soon filled the passenger compartment and Cora was forced to pull over. While this all happened, the entity vanished into the darkness. Vincent and Carmen Coral, their car's electrical system ruined, were left to wonder what had happened. All right, now I want to talk about the Arcane Radio, which is like a paranormal radio station. So in 2015, the host of the paranormal Arcane Radio received the following letter. This one's kind of long, guys, so strap in, or again, you can double tap like five times now, probably. Hello, when I was in my early teens, I witnessed something that I've never been able to explain. This occurred in northern Minnesota. I have included a picture of what it looked like. Yo, editor, put it on screen. I was in the wood lot behind the barn around 9 p.m. It was in July 1971 and I was out there with my collie dog, Bonnie. Bonnie started barking and running towards the far edge of the woods. I called for her, but she continued running. I started to chase after her. As I got nearer to the small field, Bonnie was laying down looking towards the sky. I looked in the same direction and saw a bright yellow light coming toward us. I looked at the light and started to make out a shape. I've always said that it was a balloon man. It was round in the body and segmented legs and arms. The head was a bright yellow light. I couldn't see a face, just a bright blinding light. It hovered for a minute then moved toward me. It was right in front of me. I'd say it was eight feet tall and very wide. There was an intense heat coming from it too. I had trouble breathing and was very uncomfortable. Then it started to hover and circle around me. I thought it was going to pass out and suddenly it just disappeared. Simply vanished. As soon as it did, I dropped to the ground and started shivering. I could move, but I was so cold and felt weak and sick. I laid there for a long time. I heard my mom calling and then Bonnie was beside me barking. My mom was frantic and tried to get me to my feet. I couldn't stand. I was just too weak to move. Soon my older brothers showed up and they carried me to the house. I was sick in bed for about a week. Doctors said I had a severe reaction to the poison sumac, which I know wasn't correct. I had a sore red rash on my face and arms. The balloon man burned me somehow and had weakened me. After I recuperated, I told my mom what had happened. She was surprised by what it described. She knew I didn't have poison sumac and she didn't question the doctor. I never told anyone about my contact with the balloon man, but I told my brothers not to go into the far field at night and they just laughed. That's a pretty cool letter. Pretty cool letter. Interesting. Makes it realistic. I don't know. I don't want to get too sucked in, but this is kind of scary. Kind of cool. Kind of scary. I kind of like it actually. Next up, we have the Pascagoula Elephant Men. The Pascagoula abduction occurred in 1970. 
1973 when co-workers Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker claimed that they were abducted by aliens while fishing near Pascagoula River, Mississippi. The case earned substantial mass media attention and is, along with the earlier Hill abduction, among the best-known claims of alien abduction. They described the creatures as being roughly humanoid in shape and standing about five feet tall. The creature's skin was pale in color and wrinkled like a, quote, elephant, and they had no eyes that the men could discern, and they had slits for mouth. Their heads also appeared connected directly to their shoulders with no neck. There were three carrot-like growths instead, one where the nose would be on a human and the other two where the ears would be. The beings had lobster-like claws at the end of their arms and they seemed to only have one leg. Hickson later described the creature's lower body as looking as if their legs were fused together, and they ended in elephant-like feet. Hickson also reported that the creatures moved in mechanical, robotic ways. And yeah, there should be pictures on screen. Um, there's not a lot of info in this one that I can find, other than just that story. It's, this one's pretty scary. Elephants are scary, dude. They're like smart as hell and stuff, aren't they? And this is also the kind of thing where like, yeah, I don't know, I feel like it wouldn't be hard, but I don't know. I just don't feel like somebody would just like make this up out of nowhere, you know? Maybe it's being stupid. I'm low-key just being stupid. People can make this up. People make up stuff all the time. But I, I mean, I don't know. It's a little believable, okay? Maybe I'm just very impressionable. There's also like a whole like book on it, on this thing. This one's pretty well known. I'm not sure why this one is so low in the iceberg. I didn't make this iceberg, but I'll leave a link to it in the description. Um, I don't know why it's so low on it. I didn't make it, but next up we have Domston Blobs. The Domston Blob sighting is an extraterrestrial sighting and an attempted abduction case that took place at about 3 a.m. on December 20th, 1958. So this is back in the glory days, back in Chet Baker's time, bro. The two recorded witnesses were co-workers Stig Rydberg, 30 years old, and Hans Gustafsson, 24 years old. This happened in Sweden, by the way. So, um, shout out Blade, shout out Blade. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a lot of music references in this one, guys. Sorry. Sorry, y'all complaining the last video. Y'all were like, oh, he's listening to too much music. He's listening to too much music. Shut up, dude. I like old 1950s jazz and modern Swedish hip hop, bro. Okay, chill. Anyways, in a clearing near the village of Domston, they claimed to have fought for their lives. Their opponents were three or four gray, shapeless beings, which landed in a, like, discoid object. This event has become one of the most celebrated UFO cases both in and outside of Sweden. The UFO's diameter was about five meters, about 16 feet. Its height was about close to one meter, which is also about three foot three inches. It rested on three sorts of legs. The craft was self-illuminating, but the glare was neither blinding nor warming. In the center of the light, they thought that a darker core could be distinguished, though. The creatures were small and gray, perhaps 1.3 meters tall, which is a little over four feet, and about 40 centimeters broad, which is about 1.31 feet. They seemed to, like, lack extremities, and they were shaped like loaves, and they moved very fast. Now, a fight to the death broke out. When Rydberg struck one of the assailants, quote, his arm plunged into the creature to the elbow and the blow had no effect. The creatures had a respectable grasping ability and were able to dodge the lightning quick young men's punches as if they were anticipating their thoughts. And the creatures were then ultimately scared away by a car horn. Man, this is the kind of stuff that happens in Sweden, bro. Like, come on, dude. Sweden, are you serious, bro? I'm actually kidding. I want to move to Sweden one day, dude. If I make it as a YouTuber, if you're watching this, like, in, like, five years, I really hope that I'm living in Sweden in, like, a mansion in Sweden. That's what I want to be doing with my life. Next up, we have Alien Bigfoot. It's a funny name, bro. I'm gonna be real. Alien Bigfoot is a cryptid that is typically sighted shortly after a UFO sighting. The sightings are mainly in Pennsylvania. On the night of July 31st, 1966, a group of four friends were having a vacation at a low beach in Erie, Pennsylvania. When they went to leave, their tire was stuck in the mud. One of the boys went to find a tow truck, leaving the other boy and two girls alone. Several hours passed, and the friend still wasn't back. Then, in the night sky, they saw a figure fly in the sky. They took a close look and they didn't know what it was. Then a purple flash of light beamed in the sky and the UFO-like figure summoned a bluish purple light to the ground and then flew off. Then a policeman showed up wondering why they were sitting there at the time that it was like it was like really late. And they explained that they were stuck and they were waiting on their friend to get back. The officer offered to go take a look and the other boy went along leaving the two girls alone. Later the girls saw something rustling in the bushes. Then a six to eight foot tall figure trudged out and growled at the two. They were very frightened and the beast ran up and attacked their car. Eventually, when the others got back,
back, the girls told their story. Another sighting took place in 1966 in a very southern part of Pennsylvania. A woman was sitting in her chair in 1966, then she heard something on her back porch. She thought a pack of dogs had returned, so she got her gun. When she got out, she saw a hairy humanoid about 50 feet away. He took a shot at it, but it teleported away. Then her son-in-law came over with his gun, and then about eight of the creatures appeared and growled at him. He ran away and dropped his flashlight. The sightings were pretty active, but there's not a lot like in modern days. So that's about all the info. I mean, there's some today, but they're really just kind of repetitive, I guess. And there's already so many, you know, like there's like I go to history.com and watch a video on like there's like documentaries on, on an alien Bigfoot. I mean, I guess I should be making one. I guess I should be talking about it more actually. So, uh. but here's the thing is that all the new ones are like behind a paywall. You got to like pay to read all the new ones. And I can't do that. I'm poor. I'm 17 years old. I hope it's enough, guys. If it's not enough, let me know. And I promise I'll do better next time, guys. I'll put in more info next time. I hope that's enough on Alien Bigfoot, though. Let me know if it's not, and I'll do more. Next up, we have Also One. The Also One sighting was an extraterrestrial sighting that took place on the afternoon of October 25th, 1974. The witness was a 41-year-old oil well driller, husband and father of four. His name was Carl Higdon, who decided to take the day off to hunt for elk in the northern region of Medicine Bow National Park, which is located just 40 miles south of his home in Rowling. Upon encountering a group of elk, Higdon silently raised his heavy rifle, put his eye to the sight, and took aim at the largest male. As soon as Higdon pulled the trigger of his magnum, he was astounded by the fact that there was no kickback rifle. What was even more perplexing was the fact that the detonation was absolutely silent. Higdon claimed that he was able to watch as a bullet left the barrel of his rifle and soared forward so slowly that it looked as if it were traveling through like a wall of invisible jello is how he described it. A bizarre alien being then slowly approached and Higdon was pretty scared and then the alien asked him how you doing? The hunter admitted that he was trying to stay calm and then he weakly responded pretty good. And then the alien asked him if he was hungry but before he could respond the creature sent a small clear cellophane package floating toward him which contained four pills. The strange jawless humanoid then introduced himself as also one. That was when Higdon's gaze caught a strange box like object catching the sun's rays in the clearing behind the strange creature. Intrigued by the awe at which Higdon was staring at the ship, the alien asked the hunter, do you want to come along? Higdon shrugged, and the next thing he remembers, like, it was, like, time just, like, sped up again, because the next thing he remembers, he was on the cube-like craft. Higdon later recalls being given a tour of Also One's home planet. Pretty crazy. The six-foot entity appeared to be a humanoid being clad in a skin-tight black one-piece outfit that Higdon described as being similar to a wetsuit scuba divers wear. Atop the suit was a pair of harness-like straps that crisscrossed its chest, below which was a metallic belt adorned with a large yellow six-pointed star, and then beneath the star was an insignia that the outdoorsmen just couldn't identify. The visitor had no detectable ears, his eyes were small, and he lacked eyebrows. The dome of his skull was covered with incredibly coarse hair, almost as if he had a straw growing out of his head. Or not a straw, like straw, like, you know, like the stuff they feed to like horses and stuff. The creature possessed a lipless, slit-like mouth that concealed three exceptionally large teeth on the top and on the bottom, and a pair of antennas, and, most alarmingly to Higdon, a face that blended directly into its neck. The creature had a pointy, almost drill bit-like appendage sticking out of its wrist where its right hand ought to have been and nothing at all on the left. Higdon later swore that he watched the bullet glide about 50 feet before it plummeted to the snow-speckled ground before him. Higdon cautiously retrieved the bullet and inspected it closely. He immediately noticed that the lead portion of the bullet had disappeared and only the oddly misshapen case remained. This could be a hoax. I mean, there's no proof. <laughs> there's literally just like zero evidence. But there's also no evidence that it was a hoax, so it could be real too, you never know. All right, and that was layer four, guys. Let's get into layer five. The first one in this layer is the Wallowa Lake Freshwater Crustaceans. Giant freshwater crustaceans are giant crustaceans like crabs inhabiting the area in and around Wallowa Lake that appear heavily in the tales of early settlers of Oregon. Although no true lobsters live on the Pacific coast, only spiny lobsters or langoosts, there are many large crabs, but these freshwater crabs would even exceed the largest known crabs in size. It is possible that these things did exist, but according to the records, the crustaceans just plain disappeared. No one knows whether they merely died or if they migrated somewhere else. Perhaps someone should investigate any remote areas of the Pacific Northwest in hopes of finding them, as a giant crab should be easier to find than a giant ape. <laughs> it's wondered if the species may be related to the Sandwalker, which is another cryptid. Sandwalker is a legendary beast from Arab mythology. It's a huge 
huge nocturnal crab about the size of a horse with a bird-like beak and a scorpion's tail. It's pretty interesting. And also there's another legend associated with the Wallowa Lake called the Wallowa Lake Monster, which I low-key might talk about because Wallowa Lake just has a bunch of like interesting legends. The Wallowa Lake Monster, also known as Wally, is a lake monster alleged to inhabit Wallowa Lake, Oregon. It's described as being roughly between 8 and 20 feet long and it's hump-shaped. A local legend among the Nets Pierce tribe states that when the Nets Pierce and Blackfeet were at war, the daughter of the Nets Pierce chief fell in love with the son of the Blackfoot chief. One night, the couple took a canoe from the Nets Pierce camp and rode out on the lake. Eventually, the rival tribes realized what was happening and set out after them. The monster then came up out of the lake and attacked them, killing them. And to this day, the Nez Perce do not venture out on that lake. So yeah, Wallowa Lake, kind of scary, kind of scary. I mean, if there's two legends there, it's like, one of them's got to be real, right? I mean, that's just a crazy odds that that would just happen twice, you know? Like, at least one of them's got to be real, right? Or no? <laughs> the Mikaeli Im- Next up, we have Mikaeli Mbembe. The Mikaeli Mbembe, which means the one who stops the flow of the rivers in the Lingala language, is a dinosaur-like cryptid that lives in the Congo. It is said to look like a sauropod or a long-necked dinosaur. The Mikaeli Mbembe was the focus of the children's book Cryptid Hunters by Roland Smith. There have been many sightings in the Congo and Cameroon, and its meat is apparently poisonous, as a group of villagers once killed one and everybody who ate the meat died shortly afterward. Besides the Sasquatch, Loch Ness Monster, Chupacabra, and Mothman, this is probably the, or at least one of the most well-known cryptids. Which again, is it though? Is it though? Because it's Loki on this iceberg called Lesser Known Cryptids, and I Loki have never ever heard of the Makole Mbembe in my life. So Loki, I think that's wrong, okay? That's what the wiki said. It said, the wiki said that it's one of the most well-known cryptids. I'm calling bull, bro. If y'all have heard of the Michele Mbembe, maybe I'm just stupid. Maybe I'm just sheltered and dumb. But Loki, I've never heard of it before in my life. Anyways, in the jungles of the Central African countries of Congo, Cameroon, and Gavin, there were reports of an animal with a long neck, a long tail, and rounded shaped tracks with three claws. The closest known animal that has these characteristics is a sauropod dinosaur. When some of the local people of the region would draw in the sand or the dirt a representation of the Makole Mbembe, they drew the shape of a sauropod dinosaur. Then, when they were shown a picture of a sauropod dinosaur, they said that picture is Makole Mbembe. Makole Mbembe, again, means one that stops the flow of rivers. A French priest in the region called it monstrous animal. Makole Mbembe is also used as a generic term to refer to other animals in the region that are just, like, big and scary. Makole Mbembe has been described as an animal with a long neck and tail, which were characteristics, again, of a sauropod dinosaur. Put pictures on screen of what a sauropod dinosaur is, bro. Its body size is somewhere between the size of a hippopotamus and an elephant. Its length has been reported to be between 5 to 10 meters, or about 16 to 32 feet. The length of a neck is between 5 to 10 feet, and the length of the tail is between 5 and 10 feet. The reports out of Cameroon have reported Macaulay and Mbembe to be up to 75 feet in length. There have also been reports of a frill on the back of the head. The frill is like the comb found in a male chicken. There have also been reports of it having a horn on its head. This could be based on terrified locals who have found bones of prehistoric sauropods like these. I just put pictures on screens. I don't want to have to. I don't want to try to pronounce these because y'all gonna make fun of me. So th these are the sauropods. Put some pictures on screen. <laughs> Although these only grew up to be 45 feet. The color of the skin is predominantly reddish brown, with the color range from gray to brown. There are no reports of hair on the animal. So there's our so the sightings range all the way back to 1992 during a Japanese expedition. There's also one in 1992 in Operation Congo too. Also in November of 2000, February of 2001, and April of 2000. These guys leave tracks too. The tracks are round in shape and are between 30 to 90 centimeters in diameter with three claws. The distance between tracks is about 7 to 8 feet, and the basic belief is that Makuli and Bimbe does not make sounds, though there have been some conflicting reports. This is probably due to the fact that Makuli and Bimbe is used generically for other animals and the sound is being confused with Emile Niktoa, which makes a sound like a snort, howl, roar, rumble, or growl. Makuli and Bimbe lives in the pools and swamps adjacent to the rivers of the swamp region of the People's Republic of Congo on the continent of Africa, and it uses lakes as a crossing path to go from one river to another river. A West African carving of a strange animal currently housed at a house in County Tipperary in Ireland is believed by some cryptologists to represent the Macaulay and Bimbe. It 
depicts a scaly animal with a large neck, a small head, cloven feet, a long tail, and a fin structure below its tail. It is alongside a smaller creature with smaller features, but no neck, and its relationship with the smaller animal is unclear, although it has been suggested that the carving may be a modern creation, it has apparently been at that house since at least the 1950s, decades before the western interest in the Macaulay and Bembe. Also, there's a picture of the Macaulay and Bembe on Google Earth, which, check this out, I mean, it's kind of hard to look at, really, it's hard to tell, but like, check this out, dude. So, people of the swamp region where this guy lives report that the essential diet of the Macaulay and Bembe consists of the Malombo plant. Since it only eats plants, the Macaulay and Bembe is a herbivore. The Macaulay and Bembe lives most of the time underwater, except when it eats or when it travels, and it's also been reported that the Macaulay and Bembe does not like hippopotamuses and will kill them on sight, but it doesn't eat them. Hippopotamuses cannot be found where the Macaulay and Bembe lives, though. It's been reported that the Macaulay and Bembe will overturn boats and kill the people from the boats by biting them and hitting them with its tail, but it doesn't eat the people. If this was a living sauropod, most scientists and paleontologists doubt it would become hostile or carnivorous due to the fact that there are over a thousand kinds of plants in the Congo. So, Loki, this could just be an ant- this could just still be a freaking dinosaur that's just still alive, you know? Like, birds are still here, they're dinosaurs, so like, this just could be a dinosaur, bro. I mean, I don't think it's that, like, unplausible, you know? Alright, next up we have the elephant humanoid. The elephant humanoids were a strange series of sightings that reported wrinkled bipedal humanoids with a snout. And again, bipedal just means walking on two legs. These creatures, or creature, was spotted in Narrabeen Lake, which is in New South Wales, Australia. In 1968, a woman named Mabel Walsh saw a strange being standing in the lake. Her description was this. It was a bit over four feet tall, with dark gray, tough, leathery skin like an elephant's. It had small front legs and walked on its hind legs, which were thick and round like an elephant's. There were no tail or ears, but I saw a trunk that was like an anteater's, rigid and squared off at the end and stuck out at an angle. It then came out of the water, stood up on its legs, and ran into a bush with a shuffling sideways run. In 1971, there were two fishermen who were fishing on Narrabeen Lake at night. They saw a peculiar brutish gray animal with an unusual locomotion as it went through the water. Later that night, an anonymous woman said she was awoken by a horrible gurgling noise. There was no proof, though, that it was the same creature, but, you know. Though the creature has not been sighted since that night, it has raised speculation about what this creature could have been. But nonetheless, it is still remembered as one of the most bizarre cryptozoological wonders of the world. Now, Australia has long been known for its bizarre fauna, like animals, both known and unknown. But there are a few beasts to rival these. Like, I mean, have you seen the spiders in Australia, bro? The bugs is crazy. I do not want to go there ever in my life. Now, Norbin Lake is the largest of three rainforest shrouded estuaries located within a nine mile stretch of coast along Sydney's northern beach, which is situated in the state of New South Wales. Now, whenever Mabel Walsh, I told you her description, but the, like when she saw this cryptid, she was driving along the Wakehurst Parkway alongside Narrabeen Lake with her nephew, John. The pair was cruising at approximately 45 miles per hour en route to Newport, when they both spied the peculiar sighting in the shallow water of the lake. Now, remember the other sighting I told you about where that one guy thought he saw something and then like a lady at night heard a gurgling noise? Well, not long after that night's incident, a reporter named Frank O'Neill wrote a tongue-in-cheek account of the fisherman's tale as it was told to him by a, like, a bunch of neighborhood kids. After a seemingly obligatory comparison to the famous Nessie, O'Neill explained how the kids were warning and attempting to, like, uh, warn him about the potential dangers of the Narrabeen monster. During the late 1970s, UFO researcher Bill Chalker investigated this phenomenon. Well, while his on-site examinations would ultimately prove fruitless, he did propose a potentially intriguing association between these humanoid elephants and ancient Hindu texts. Now, this is a quote from him. I spent a number of evenings loitering around the Narrabeen lakes, checking out the areas and involved in these stories. Unfortunately, no elephant humanoids were seen, and I was not able to determine any substance to a elephant connection. It is interesting that humanoid elephant-headed beings are a major feature of Indian religious mythology, namely Ganesha. Now, also, farmer Cecil McGann related an extraordinary tale to Chalker in a 19-page letter, which he sent to him in 1985. In the letter, McGann told a plethora of strange tales involving UFOs and brutally butchered livestock, but one event in particular piqued Chalker's 
interest. The account involved a group of truly curious creatures that began spied on his family farm in northern New South Wales when he was 10 years old, all the way back in 1927. In a scenario that is difficult not to compare to the Point Pleasant, not pleasure, Mothman encounters, the McGann family and their neighbors had for weeks been tormented by strange zigzagging lights in the sky, giant birds, mysterious nighttime visitors, precisely exsanguinated cows and pigs, and a paddock full of spooked farm animals. One night after watching an odd illuminated object perform aerial feats that would be difficult today and impossible in the 1920s, the family settled down for bed, dismissing the UFO as a dancing star. However, the following morning, the cattle seemed agitated and refused to return to their gazing field. But within a few days, the cattle were down the hill and their grazing field until about 2 p.m. McGann insists the herd stampeded back up the rise, eyes bulging with terror. The cows refused to return to their paddock and were eventually allowed to bed down in a small enclosure near the farmhouse. The cows remained in the enclosure for days and it was soon noticed that one of the herd had gone missing. McGann was sent down to the field to see if he could wrangle the missing one. There was no way he could realize that he was about to lay eyes on something that would haunt him for the rest of his days. In McGann's own words, I walked out onto the ridge in our day paddock to see if she, a cow, had ventured out there during the day and a strange scene confronted me as I looked down the ridge as there were two objects, one down on a small flat at the bottom of a ridge and one amid bushes halfway down the ridge and they were moving about and looked like small elephants. In retrospect, McGann speculated that what he perceived to be elephant features could have been space suits, a concept that would have been virtually incomprehensible in 1927, used to protect what he believed very well may have been alien. And then the next morning, the family discovered three large pigs dead behind an eight foot high fence. The carcasses had marks on their necks, but much like cases involving the nefarious chupacabras, there was no evidence of split blood at the scene. And despite all of this, it's worth noting that nearly two weeks following the Walsh encounter, on April 16th, 1968, there was a quote, rash of UFO sightings over Sydney. These sluggish star-like objects were spotted from several suburbs between 6 and 635. Could be an alien that looks like an elephant or just that is using an elephant as like a form. Pretty interesting. This one's got a lot to it. A lot of detail, a lot of stuff. Pretty cool. Next up we have Jabafofi. Now this one was terrifying to me. This was terrifying, bro. You'll see why, you'll see why. The Jabafofi, also known as the Congolese giant spiders, are a type of large arachnid cryptid which is said to inhabit the forest of the Congo, possibly representing a new species of arachnida. Now, not yet, but I will put pictures on screen. I'll give you a warning first. Editor, please put a warning before the pictures are on screen. Three, two, one. These are the pictures of the cryptid, and now it's over. Most of the many anecdotal tales describe the spiders digging a shallow tunnel under tree roots and camouflaging it with a large screen of leaves. Then they create an almost invisible web between their burrow and a nearby tree, stringing the whole area with a network of trip lines. Some oblivious animal that's likely soon to end up on the creature's menu will end up tripping the line, alerting the spider. The victim will then be chased into the web. This type of predatory behavior is similar to that of several species of trapdoor spider. Natives claim the Jabafofi eggs are a pale yellow white and shaped like peanuts, and the hatchlings are a bright yellow with a purple abdomen. Their coloration becomes darker and brown as they mature. Some of the peoples indigenous to the regions in the Congo where the Jabafofi have been seen assert that the spider was once quite common but has since become very rare. The fullest account by Westerners appears in a cryptozoological book by George Eberhardt. On page 204, Eberhardt relates a terrifying experience of an English couple traveling through a region in the jungle in what is now called the Congo. Quote, R.K. Lloyd and his wife were motoring in the Belgian Congo in 1938 when they saw a large object crossing the trail in front of them. At first, they thought it was a cat or a monkey, but they soon realized it was a spider with legs nearly three feet. Cryptozo Cryptozoologist William J. Gibbons was hunted for what some might think be a living Congolese dinosaur called the Mokale Mbembe, which we already talked about. And then on his third expedition in search of the creature, he came upon natives who related their experiences with giant spiders. He shared his experience with readers upon his return to Canada with this quote. On this third expedition to equatorial Africa, I took the opportunity to inquire if the Pygmies knew of such a giant spider, and indeed they did. They speak of the Jabafofi, which is a giant or great spider. They described a spider that is generally brown in color with a purple mark on the abdomen. They grow to quite an enormous size with a leg span of at least five feet. The giant arachnids weave together a layer made of leaves similar to shape to a traditional pygmy hut and spin a circular web, said to be very strong, between two trees with a strand stretched across a game trail. These giant ground drilling spiders prey on the diminutive forest antelope, birds, and other small game and are said to be 
extremely dangerous, not to mention highly venomous. The spiders are said to lay white, peanut-sized eggs in a cluster, and the pygmies give them a wide berth when encountered, but have killed them in the past. The giant spiders were once very common, but are now a rare sight. Now, in March 2013, a video surfaced on YouTube of an alleged Bafofi caught in a night vision camera near a water hole next to a tree in Mozambique. And uh, close your eyes now if you don't want to see it. I'm going to put it on screen over this next sentence. So close your eyes now. The Jabba Fofi appears out of darkness for a brief moment while scurrying into the darkness on the far right side of the screen. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Many of the natives describe the spiders as being once numerous, but now vanishing. This one seems kind of real. I mean, there could just be big spiders, you know? There could just be like big spiders that exist. Like, this one isn't very far fetched. Fetched. You know what I mean? All right, next up we got Trunko. Trunko is the nickname for an animal reportedly sighted in Margate, South Africa on October 25th, 1924. According to an article entitled Fish Like a Polar Bear, published in the December 27th, 1924 edition of London's Daily Mail, the animal was reputedly first seen off the coast battling two killer whales, which fought the unusual creature for three hours. It used its tail to attack the whales and reportedly lifted itself out of the water by about 20 feet. The creature reputedly washed up on the Margate beach, but despite being there for 10 days, no scientist ever investigated the carts, so no reliable description has been published, and until September 2010, it was assumed that no photographs of it had ever been published. Some people who have never been identified were reported to have described the animal as possessing snowy white fur, an elephant-like trunk, a lobster-like tail, and a carcass devoid of blood. While it was beached, the animal was measured by beachgoers and turns out to be about 14 meters or 47 feet in length. The trunk was said to be attached directly to the animal's torso, as no head was visible on the carcass. For this feature, the animal was dubbed Trunko by British zoologist Carl Schuker in his 1996 book, The Unexplained. In the March 27th, 1925 edition of Charloi Mail in Charloi, Pennsylvania, an article entitled Whales Slain by Hairy Monster reported that whales were killed there by a strange creature which was washed up on a beach, exhausted, and fell unconscious, but made its way back into the ocean and swam away after 10 days, never to be seen again. All right, guys, and that was Lair 5. Let's get straight into Lair 6. Starting with the Tatsil Worm. Tatsil Worm, also called Alps Dragon, is a cryptid reported in several areas in Europe, including Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, and many other places in the European Alps for hundreds of years. It has several regional names, um, including Stolen Worm, Spring Worm, Erastus, Pratzel Worm, and Brextitzen. I should put all those on screen. Um, I probably mispronounced them. <laughs> I don't know, I don't speak European. Reports of this creature vary in description from a serpentine reptile or amphibian to a feline chimera to something resembling a small Asian dragon. The most common description is of a lizard or a snake-like creature with a stubby appearance, two front legs without hind legs, completely covered in scales everywhere, and a cat-like face. This thing sounds kind of awesome and kind of cute, dude. I don't know, the cat-like face kind of won me over. The tapsel worm is also believed to be dangerously venomous, able to kill a human instantly with its bite, breathing poisonous fumes and even processing acid. The earliest documented encounter with the tapsel worm took place in 1779 when two of these creatures appeared in front of a man named Hans Fuchs. Badly frightened by his encounter, Hans suffered a fatal heart attack. However, before he died, he was able to tell his family of what he saw. He described the creature as five to seven feet in length with a snake-like body, clawed front legs, and a large feline-like head with sharp teeth. In 1828, a peasant supposedly found the corpse of a tapsel worm, which by the time he managed to bring it home, cows had apparently eaten half of it. Even so, the tapsel worm built up quite a following of believers and was even considered fact in the 19th century. It's now believed that even if this creature did actually exist, that because sightings are so rare now, it might be just totally extinct. Two other illustrations of the tapsel worm are also known to exist. The first of which appeared in a Bavarian hunting manual called New Pocket Guild of the year 1836 for nature, forest, and hunting instances. And that one should be on screen right now. This manual contains what Bernard Hevelman describes as a curious picture of a sort of scaly cigar with formidable teeth and wretched little stumps of feet. The second of these illustrations appeared in the Swiss almanac Alpen Rosen, published in 1841, and took the form of a drawing which shows a long, scaly creature with two tiny front legs. In late 1954, a Swiss photographer by the name of Balkan claimed to have photographed a tassel worm. The level of interest produced by the photograph's publication led the Berliner Illustrate, a weekly illustrated magazine in Germany, to sponsor an expedition in search of the tassel. However, the results of this winter expedition were disappointing and interest in the creature all but disappeared. Today, the majority of cryptozoologists view the photograph taken by Balkan as almost certainly a hoax. But here's the picture anyways. Another piece of evidence now considered to be a hoax was the discovery of a tassel worm skeleton said to have 
have been mysteriously donated to the Geneva Institute of Science sometime in the 900s. The skeleton, only known by a single photograph, appears to be that of a long snake-like creature with two clawed arms and a larger than normal head. It is also not certain though who donated the skeleton or if it was ever donated to anyone at all. The majority of researchers believe the photograph and the story behind it to be a hoax, but here's the picture anyways. There are also other tales of the legend of the tassel worm. The first tale is that of a young girl who was working on a Swiss farm. While chopped down bean poles, she accidentally disturbed the burrow of a tassel worm and was attacked. The tassel worm in this account was described as being of a gray coloration and about the size of a common domesticated cat with a fleshy hairless body and possessing only two front legs. According to the story, the tassel worm glared at the girl and she ran away, describing big bright eyes too intense to meet. Another story tells that of a man and his son out gathering herbs in the mountains when the man suddenly heard his son scream and seemed to be paralyzed in fear staring at a rock. The man sprinted to his son only to see a gruesome monster under the rock near his son which hissed like a snake and had the face of a cat with bright eyes. The man managed to stab the tassel worm with a sharpened stick, easily piercing the flesh. According to the story, the green blood of the creature sprayed out and burnt the man's leg, making his journey home long and painful due to the limp he got. In July 1883 or 1884, the details are kind of like blurry, Casper Arnold saw a tassel worm on the Spielberg in Austria. He watched it from a mountain restaurant for 20 minutes and was certain it only had two legs. Bro, if you see this thing for 20 minutes, are you not, like, gonna say something to anybody? 20 minutes? Like, I don't know, if I saw a creature like this, bro, I'd be either, like, running or going to catch, like, like, something. Like, he's just gonna, like, enjoy his little meal. <laughs> not tell anybody? That's crazy. A two-legged tassel worm leaped nine feet in the air toward two witnesses, also in Austria, in the summer of 1921. It was gray, about two to three feet long, and had a head like a cat. Also, in 1924, the five-foot-long skeleton allegedly was found by two men who said that it resembled a lizard, but there's no evidence. In the year 2000, a strange skeleton was forwarded to a local college. Some scientists said at the time it is the first physical proof of the alpine tassel worm. Along with the skeleton came a sizable donation as well. The original owner of the skeleton still remains a mystery. In 2009, many reports were made in the Trezzevio area of Italy near the Swiss border. Authorities chalked up most of these reports to missing monitor lizards that had escaped their masters. Some of the sightings were even said to be of raptor dinosaurs. Only the oldest residents of Trezzevio call the mysterious creatures by the name they have always known them as, a basilisk. And a basilisk was the Italian name for tassel worm. That's pretty cool. Hey, if you're still here watching this video this late into it, you're a real one, bro. You're a real one, bro, and I owe you, like, uh, buy you a pop six kid and bro, Kaiser. <laughs> but you're a real one. Put it in the comments, bro, and I'll, I'll respond and be like, real one, and I'll get you some clout, bro. Next up, we have Beeb's Abyssal Fishes. Beeb's Abyssal Fishes are deep sea fish observed by William Beebe in a bathysphere in the North Atlantic Ocean off of Nonsuch Island, Bermuda between 1930 and 1934 and never seen since. Beebe's bathysphere dives incorporated the first direct observations of abyssal fishes and their natural environment. On November 22nd, 1932, Bermuda Bay zoologist Dr. William Beebe was 2100 feet beneath the surface of the sea in a bathysphere, sighted five miles southeast of Bermuda's Nonsuch Island. While he was observing the denizens of the deep passing by the bathysphere window, two very unusual fishes became illuminated in the craft's electric beam of light as they swam past it twice, no more than eight feet away. Their long slender bodies, each of which was about six foot long with strongly undershot jaws housing numerous teeth, reminded Beeb of barracudas, but running along either side of each fish was a single laterally sided horizontal row of venous organs. Equally striking were the two twitching tentacle-like structures that hung down beneath each fish, one arising from its lower jaw, the other from the beginning of his short anal fin. Once again, each of these structures emitted light by virtue of a pair of organs at its tip. Um, okay, I know that you guys get mad whenever I, like, skip over an entry, right? So that's not what I'm trying to do here with this one. But everything I'm finding about this is just, like, really boring, like, scientific stuff, you know? Like, it's just, oh, he saw these weird-looking fish. Like, that's the whole thing. Like, really, like, I don't want to waste your time. You can look it up for yourself. I'll, I mean, you can, like, research it. It's just Beebs abyssal fishes. He just saw some, like, deep-sea luminous glowing fish that look weird and, like, big. And they're special because they're so deep, right? And those kinds of fishes aren't really found that deep in the ocean. But yeah, if I find anything else, I'll put it on screen now. I'll give it to my editor to put it on screen now. Um, I don't think there's anything though, Loki. I don't think there's anything though. Just like some boring like school project type type stuff. So now we're getting into the Drekovac, which is a really cool one. And I made a video on it. I spent forever on it. It's like an hour long back in the day, back before I was doing good on YouTube and it got like a 200 views, bro. So sad. Anyways, anyways. Drekovac, which is literally translated to the screamer from acrylic is a cryptid in South Slavic lore. Now this one's a lot 
lot. There are a whole lot of sightings for this one, so just stay strapped in. This one's really interesting though. Trust me, it's gonna be a longer one, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, you can just like double tap the screen if you wanna skip it, but you don't wanna skip this one. This one's cool. This one's cool, you don't wanna skip it, okay? Drekovac comes from the souls of children who have died unbaptized. The creature is not consistently described. One description is that its body is dappled, elongated, and as thin as a spindle with a disproportionately large head. But a modern find of a supposed Drekovac body looked like a dog or fox, but with hind legs like a kangaroo. It may also appear in the form of a child and call for people passing through the cemetery to baptize it. One more modern description says it is kind of a primate. But the one feature that everyone agrees on is its horrifying yell. Drekovac can be seen at night, especially during the 12 days of Christmas, which are called the unbaptized days in Serbo-Croatian, and also in early spring when other demons appear most often. In the form of the child, it predicts someone's death, but in the form of the animal, it predicts cattle disease. Drekovac rarely bothers its parents as it is afraid of dogs. The Drekovac is often used as a child scare in a similar way as a banshee is in the west, but it's probably a lot more useful than the banshee in rural areas as children would surely sometimes hear the sound of some animal and attribute it to the Drekovac, thus convincing them that it really exists which would then prevent them from like wandering far from home. In the cities, however, belief in it has faded and Baba Roga, which more closely resembles the western boogeyman, is much worse. Though the creature is used as a scare tactic for children, there are also adults who actually believe in its existence. According to the guide of reporter of Duga magazine, numerous villagers on the mountain of like, Zlatibor, Zlatibor report seeing it, and almost everyone reports hearing it. It is commonly sighted all over Bosnia and Serbia, and more rarely in Croatia, Montenegro, and North Macedonia. Now I'm going to go through all the sightings in chronological order. First of all is the Kusinbreg sighting. In an article released by the Serbian newspaper Novosti magazine in 2016, one person claimed that his grandfather saw a Drekovac on Kusinbreg, or Kusin Hill, near Lepovo in 1928. According to him, his grandfather was returning home in a horse-drawn carriage when the horses suddenly started freaking out. He got out of the carriage to see what was wrong, and he eventually sighted a small, black, hairy creature similar to a child, which was moving very fast. The creature attacked him and wouldn't stop until the rooster started singing. In Serbian tradition, it's only safe to go outside once the rooster starts singing. And then he told what happened to him to a priest who told him that various other people reported the same thing. The next one is the Kravika sighting. In 1991 or 1992, according to some sources, the villagers in the village of Kravika found a carcass of an unknown animal. The villagers claimed that it was the Drekovac. The animal was 31.5 inches long, furless, and similar to a dog. It had a snake-like head with long canine teeth, a long neck, long hind legs, similar to that of a kangaroo, and membranes between its toes. One villager proposed a theory that the beast was made in a natal lab and released into the wild. It's also worth noting that the Drekovac are thought to appear before the start of a war, and less than a year after the sighting, the Yugoslav Wars would begin. Here's a picture of it on screen um, of this exact sighting. The most likely explanation, though, is that this is just like a fox. All right, the next one is the Jezero sightings. In the late 90s, it was rumored that Drekovac, as well as some other monsters, were appearing near the Silver Lake, or Jezero, in Serbia. But this is also probably a fox. Next one. In 2003, Serbian newspapers reported that an unknown dog-like beast, which some people think is a Drekovac, had killed over 200 sheep in the period of two and a half years in the village of Tomino Fulje, at the foot of a mountain. It's also mentioned that during the night, screeches can be heard in the area, but also this might have just been a fox. Alright, next one. In 2006, a man from Lepova Selo claimed that he was attacked by a Drekovac on a hill in the western part of the village. He said that he forgot his bag in the field, so he went back for it. It was late at night, and he was very tired. He took the bag and started returning home when something jumped on his back all of a sudden. He said that the beast sounded like a dog and looked like a big child, but heavier. He tried to fight off the beast, but couldn't, so he fell to his knees and started praying to God, to which the beast disappeared. Allegedly, at the place where he got attacked by the beast, there was once a Turkish cemetery the villagers destroyed. Alright, the next one happened in 2008. In the village of Salas Nokajski, an unknown beast killed 54 sheep and goats and around 100 poultry in the span of two months. One villager noted that the animals this creature was killing were between 60 and 70 kilograms, or about 132 to 154 pounds in weight. While another villager said that the beast entered his barn through a window that was at a height of 20 feet. This one also could have been a, uh, this one also could have been a fox. Okay, there's so many of these stories. Like, there's literally, like, 15 left, and they're all just, like, so, just, like, little short things. I'm not gonna go, I don't think, I really just don't want to bore you guys. Like, this is another one where they're just all in the same thing, you know? There were a few in 2011, one in 2012, one in 2013, one in 2014, one in 2016, two in 2015, one in 2017, one in 2018, another one in 2018, another one in 2020, and then one in 2023. There's just so many of them, and they're 
are all just so similar. People see something that looks like a dog or a bear between the sizes, like near a mountain usually. You know, I just don't want to bore you guys. I'm sorry. Next is the Bergkong. All right, this one's Norwegian and uh, shout out Norway. Honestly, shout out Norwegians. Bergkong, also known as the Mountain King, is a creature of lore that can assume the shape of a man wearing nothing but a cape made of leaves. He appears in the forest, seduces women who he finds alone, and brings them into the mountains with him. The women are never seen again. In its non-human form, the Berg Kong was said to have been monstrously huge, and some kind of arachnid or lizard-like creature roaming in the forests and mountain ranges, and he's said to live in Dover, Norway. In Norwegian folklore, there are tales of the Berg Kong. If translated, the name means Mountain King. The Mountain King is described as a handsome man covered in a cape with leaves with nothing under it. This one apparently was racist though. Apparently people, like, there's a theory that this guy was first spotted and he's just like a minority, <laughs> and then people thought he was like a creature. It's actually really messed up, right? Now that I think about it, that's actually really messed up. Next up, we have the Baba Yaga. In Slavic folklore, mostly in Russia, but also in Croatia, Poland, and Serbia, Baba Yaga is a supernatural being or a witch that takes the form of a hideous old woman. Baba Yaga is usually described as wearing a cloak or dress with bright red eyes and teeth of sharpened stone or metal. It's said that she lives in a hut deep in the woods that stands on chicken legs, or one chicken leg, surrounded by a fence of bones taken from her victims, and that she flies around in a mortar wielding a pestle. There are sometimes known to be three Baba Yagas who are sisters, and in those cases, they all have the same name. And that's the iceberg, guys. We did it. We did it. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Cryptids are awesome. Cryptids are awesome. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Subscribe, like, join my Discord. Um, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Have a great day and sweet dreams.